Uh, Bill Plummer and I have uh, just been demonstrating a phenomenon first discovered by Heinrich Hertz in uh, 1886. Uh, it's concerned with the effect of uh, radiation on an electrical discharge. We have been getting our radiation from a carbon arc. This concave uh, first surface mirror has collected uh, some of that radiation <clears throat> and focused it on this uh, magnesium plate connected to the negative electrode uh, of a high potential source. And we have an uh, aluminum ball connected to the positive electrode. And we've adjusted the source very carefully so that when we have the plate uh, in the beam that's shining on the magnesium, we just don't get a spark. But you notice when we take the plate out, then we get a spark. Some radiation that wouldn't go through the plate hit the magnesium electrode when we took the plate out. And that was the thing that caused the spark to flow. This was a precursor discovery made by Hertz, which led to a great many uh, experiments of uh, great importance. And we are going to repeat some of those for you this afternoon. We use this natural light instead of uh, the uh, uh, carbon arc we had inside, and we could use this simple electroscope instead of all that elaborate equipment that we had inside. Uh, Bill has put a glass plate on the front of it to protect the needle from the wind, and uh, he's wrapped the glass plate with wires to uh, shield the needle from any electric charge that might be on the plate. The wires are connected to the can of the electroscope. And now will you put a negative charge on the electroscope with that uh, plastic rod that uh, gives a negative charge? Uh, here uh, <coughs> is a piece of lead foil. And if uh, you'd hand me a, uh, some of the steel wool, I'll get it clean. We'll put it on the uh, uh, electroscope. And uh, of course, when I touch the electroscope, that discharges it. If you give me the piece of glass and uh, charge it negatively, I'll uh, hold this glass in front of the lead. And there we have a charge. Now I remove the glass and uh, we see that the uh, electroscope isn't discharging. Now I'll try uh, magnesium. Uh, this uh, has to have uh, its oxide removed too. And uh, I'll bend it and put it on here. And uh, now if you charge that negatively, we'll uh, see that the, it isn't discharging with the glass in place, but if we take the glass away and let the sun fall on, it discharges, put the glass back, we s slow the discharge up and take it away and it discharges much more rapidly. Let's do the experiment once more, this time with the electroscope charged positively with a different uh, plastic that gives a positive charge when it's rubbed. And now when I take the glass out, the electroscope doesn't discharge with the magnesium plate on it as it did before. We have just seen that the photoelectric effect depends upon the sign of the charge and the kind of metal on which the light falls. When the light from a carbon arc lamp is concentrated by means of a concave mirror 
on a magnesium plate as before, we can get a similar effect. And furthermore, we can spread out the spectrum of the carbon arc lamp with a diffraction grating and find out what part of the spectrum is causing that effect. We have arranged our grating and our arc with a card so that we can see what part of the spectrum is shining on the magnesium. And as we move the spectrum across this card, you will see that the part which causes the electroscope to discharge lies beyond the violet end of the spectrum. This is the ultraviolet region. Magnesium responds to ultraviolet light by emitting negative charges. Other metals emit them for certain visible light frequencies, and all metals emit negative charge when struck by radiation of high enough frequency, like soft x-rays. Because of the color sensitivity of this film, the ultraviolet striking the magnesium appears visible to you here, like violet. But as you can see, the glass that we used before blocks off just enough of the ultraviolet to keep it from discharging the electroscope. By shining our spectrum on this card and by using a more complete ultraviolet filter, you can see better how the ultraviolet is blocked out by the glass. At the top of the card, on the left, the ultraviolet causes a phosphorescent paint to glow. It also shows up as violet on the uncoated side of the card because of the film's color sensitivity. If we put the filter in the path of the light, the ultraviolet is blocked out. You can see these parts of the card go black. Remove the filter and the ultraviolet gets through. We cannot see ultraviolet radiation with the naked eye, but this is one way we can demonstrate that the radiation is present in this part of the spectrum. We're going to do a more precise experiment now. We're going to do an experiment with uh, a different metal. We're going to use potassium and magnesium do the experiment in a vacuum. Uh, by doing the experiment in a vacuum, we can uh, uh, solve our cleaning problem because the potassium surface will stay clean in a vacuum. We can show that the effect which we observe is not just the ionization of the air near the metal surface because in a vacuum we won't have any air. And uh, uh, Finally, we can show that the charge uh, phenomenon is the ejection of electrons and particularly in a vacuum, we can show that the, uh, uh, we can measure the energy of the electrons that are emitted from the potassium when light falls on it. We have the potassium metal inside an evacuated glass envelope. Potassium not only shows a photoelectric effect uh, for the ultraviolet that will penetrate this envelope, but uh, for visible radiation as well. The ring of platinum wire serves to collect the electrons which the potassium may emit when it is illuminated. This cap is connected to potassium surface by a wire, and the platinum ring, which you can see, is connected uh, to the outside through a, an, an electrode opposite the cap. I will focus the light so it doesn't touch the platinum ring, but falls directly uh, on the potassium uh, through it. This uh, will cause the potassium surface to emit electrons. And if I put an ammeter in the circuit, it will measure the number of electrons emitted by the potassium and collected by the platinum ring.
Now we'll put uh, our photocell uh, in this light shield because we don't want to uh, have any light falling on the photocell except the uh, light which will come through this little hole. The platinum ring is connected to uh, the top electrode and we'll fasten this wire onto it while the uh, potassium surface, which is connected to the cap, is connected uh, now to this wire. These two wires go to uh, uh, Bill's sensitive ammeter, which is located behind the light shield. We need light on the ammeters to read them, but we don't want that light to get into our photocell. Our light source for this experiment will be a mercury vapor lamp. We uh, mount our mercury uh, lamp in a shield uh, to absorb all the light except the light we want to use, which comes out of this hole and is collected by a concave mirror, a concave front surface mirror so that the light doesn't have to go through this glass. The collected light is focused through this uh, filter, which we won't use in this experiment, so I'll take it out. Onto the aperture in the photocell shield. And uh, in order to make the shielding complete, I cover the uh, platinum collector ring electrode. And of course, I have to turn the light down. And now uh, the mercury light is a little out of adjustment. The light is focused uh, through this little hole, goes uh, inside the platinum collecting ring and falls on the potassium surface. Now, uh, let's see uh, what current we get when we let the mercury light fall on the potassium surface. We have the uh, potassium cell connected to a microammeter, and you can see the deflection of the needle as I turn the light off and on. This current measures the photoelectrons that are ejected from the potassium surface uh, by the mercury light. And a full scale deflection is one tenth of a microampere. Uh, the whole significance of the phenomenon of the ejection of uh, charge from metal surfaces when they're bombarded with light or with other electromagnetic radiation began to take form when the physicists began to measure the energy of the electrons that were ejected. And now the question is, how can we measure uh, the energy of the ejected electrons? Well, uh, this is easy. All we need to do is to put a retarding potential on the collector ring and uh, 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 vary the potential until the uh, uh, current through the microammeter just stops. And then uh, the magnitude of that potential will measure the maximum energy of the uh, uh, electrons that are ejected by the light. I have modified this simple circuit by uh, introducing a variable uh, potential. I show that as a, as a battery with an arrow through it to indicate that it's variable. To measure the potential, we have a voltmeter connected across it. You can see that I've uh, connected the negative side of the battery to the collector ring so that I make it negative with respect to the potassium to uh, uh, retard the uh, electrons. Here's the battery we're going to use. The negative lead goes to the collector wire. With a variable resistor that Bill can control by turning this knob, he can change the voltage 
and he can read the potential exactly on this meter. Now let's measure the, uh, this energy uh, of the ejected electrons, and let's measure it uh, for particular colors or frequencies. Our mercury vapor lamp uh, emits several colors or frequencies. These are its uh, characteristic spectrum lines. And we can isolate these, one uh, color from the others, by means of filters, which we have collected here. Now let's start with this combination of filters. It will pass only the uh, yellow light, which comes from the mercury lamp. And we'll mount the filters in front of the aperture in our uh, cell so that uh, only the yellow light will strike the potassium surface. Because there's less light than before, we'll put the ammeter on a more sensitive scale. And you see, when I interrupt the light with my hand, as before, the current drops to zero. Bill will now put a retarding potential on the collector ring. On the right, the voltmeter shows the amount of the retarding potential. You see that as we increase the negative potential, the current, red on the other meter, goes down to zero. To cut off the photocurrent required 0.25 volts of negative potential. Now let's watch both meters at once as we repeat that, increasing the voltage on the right until the current on the left hits zero. The retarding potential, again, was just 0.25 volts. Let's keep track of these results. The retarding potentials are plotted along the y-axis. Bill will keep track of this 0.25 volts by plotting it. Now let's try a filter which lets green light fall on the photosurface. Bill gets the retarding voltage necessary to stop the photocurrent as 0.35 volts. Now we'll try blue light. It takes a higher negative potential on the platinum ring to stop the photocurrent. In this case, Bill gets 1.05 volts. Now let's go to an even higher frequency in the mercury spectrum, into the violet. We get 1.3 volts as a cutoff potential. For the ultraviolet, we get an even higher retarding potential necessary to stop the photocurrent. of 1.7 volts. Now Bill is going to connect these points and see what kind of a plot they make.
Here the straight line tells us that the maximum energy of the electrons increase proportionally with the frequency of the light. Experiments similar to this have been done many times. In 1916, Robert Millikan published the results of his precise experiments using sodium and lithium. We have transferred his data to a graph so that we can lay it over our graph for potassium and compare it. We see that the retarding potentials needed to stop the current at any particular frequency are different, but the important thing is that each set of data gives a straight line and that the slope of each line proves to be the same. It is true that our straight line is off a little bit from the slope of the other two, but when you do experiments with a great degree of accuracy that Millikan used, then all slopes turn out to be the same. To understand the significance of these straight line results, let's go over the data. We plotted the frequency across the bottom and the energy of the emitted electrons measured by the retarding potential along here. And we got a straight line with a slope like this. The energy then of the emitted electrons for this frequency nu is just this much. The energy of the electrons emitted when the potassium was struck by light of another frequency, say here, was just this much. The amount of energy of these electrons is proportional to this frequency difference, nu minus nu zero. The amount of energy of these electrons is proportional to this frequency difference, this nu minus nu zero. And the proportionality between this energy and this frequency difference is just the same as the proportion between this energy and this other frequency difference. The factor which relates them is the slope of this straight line, and so we can express this relationship in the following way. The energy of electrons emitted at a given frequency is equal to the frequency difference, nu minus nu zero, times the slope of the line, which we express as h. This constant slope is now called Planck's constant. I'll rewrite that equation as E equals H nu minus H nu zero. Now you will remember that for a different metal, Millikan got exactly the same slope, but that it intersected this line at a different point. Thus, there is a different nu zero for each metal but because the slope is the same, this equation is true for all metals. This factor, h nu zero, then looks like it must be only a property of the metal. h is constant, but nu zero varies with the metal. It represents a property of the metal. This factor, h nu, must then be only a property of the light, and it is the same no matter what metal we use. This is an energy equation, so this must represent the energy of the light striking the metal. Light with this much energy, h nu, always causes the emission of electrons with this much energy, E. But the energy of the electrons that we measured with our retarding potential was the energy of individual electrons. We know this because the retarding potential is independent of the number of electrons flowing. I said we know this because we get the same uh, uh, cutoff potential uh, regardless of the intensity of the light. You remember we uh, used the mercury light with a uh, blue filter and we got 1.3 volts cutoff potential. Now Bill will measure the cutoff point for the blue light again, but this time he cuts down the intensity with a neutral filter. but he still gets 1.3 as a measure of the energy of the ejected electrons. We can cut off a large current at exactly the same point as a small current for any given frequency of the light. So this then is the energy of an individual event, the emission of an individual electron. Our experiments show that the 
electrons that are ejected from a metal surface by light, uh, their energy does not depend on the intensity of the light, but it depends solely on the frequency of the light. And furthermore, when we plot the energy against the frequency, we find we can represent our results with a straight line. And although different straight lines are required for different metals, they have in common uh, the same slope. And this universal slope is called Planck's constant. No other theory but the quantum theory uh, satisfactorily explains this universal slope. And so we're uh, constrained to think of light as traveling in packets. And the energy of each packet is determined solely by the frequency of the light. And we call these packets photons.